All right, almost to the end. Um, thank you very much for having me. I just wanted to uh, show you a quick video uh, to try to get you guys in the mood. Tonight, in some very real sense, we are talking about revolution. Protecting our natural resources and uh, reducing carbon emissions uh, truly are uh, the greatest entrepreneurial opportunities of our lifetimes. Entrepreneurship to reinvent the global economy, entrepreneurship to reinvent the development equation. Our goal and our job as an organization is to harness the power of entrepreneurs to unlock gigaton scale market opportunities. We have the potential as a group of leaders uh, to really create a new positive business force that supports economic growth as well as protects the wonderful natural world that we all live in. This is not only an economic issue, this is a moral and ethical dilemma. Amigas y amigos, there is no planet B. There is no planet B. Our challenge is to write a different story. To convince people that development of clean energy and energy efficiency technologies could spur the greatest economic opportunity of the 21st century. We are at the start of a significant and meaningful positive change that is good for business and is good for the environment. We've got millions and billions of dollars of capital sitting on the sidelines, but we got nothing moving. If we don't make this work, we can't address the most fundamental problems of mankind. The distribution of wealth around the world, ultimately national security threats of terrorism. We can't deal with the climate crisis which will beset mankind in the 21st century. There's a lot of opportunity for us to live better lives and if we communicate it from an opportunistic perspective and why it makes sense and why each of our individual lives will be better, how it impacts our home life how it impacts, um, you know, ultimately the planet that we leave to our children. The opportunity that we have is to pass the planet on better than we inherited. That's never been done before. So, opportunity is dressed up as a crisis. What do you think? Are we going to make it? I, you know, I think that the, the challenge we have is that we, we sort of see these um, these pictures, you know, things like, you know, BP's logo, um, you know, through the Greenpeace contest, or we see the, uh, the photos of the, the burning rig, or we see, you know, the, the actual, you know, wildlife getting decimated. And what do we do? We go home and we actually cook dinner, right? We go home and we, like, we forward the email around to our friends. What do we actually do? How do we actually solve this problem? I think this is where the carbon war room plays a different role than others. And I, I think that it's, it really comes down to the fact that we believe that the technology is not the problem. You know, everyone keeps talking about innovation. You know, uh, one of the famous TED speakers is Bjorn Lomberg, who talks about if we just invest more money into R&D. I think R&D is fantastic, right? But at the time at which we actually invent something, Call it the electric vehicle. Call it a natural gas vehicle that T. Boone Pickens is pushing on. Or call it biofuels, which there are many companies that are pre presenting here, but then are also have been around for a long time. At the time at which they create a solution, we don't actually know how to scale it up. You know, and then we go back and we say, well, you know, China knows how to scale it up. Well, I don't want to live in an autocratic society. Right? So, so don't use China for me, right? And so now the question is, how do we do it in India, in Brazil, in South Africa, in the US? How do we, as democratic nations, come together and actually make a decision? 
first we have to acknowledge that 50% of all carbon emissions globally have technologies today that can actually solve the problem, right? So this is not a technology problem. The, pro the problem is, is that they're blocked by market failures that are inconsistent with the free market. We're, you know, we always get barraged by capitalists, you know. Gosh, you know, what's wrong with the, having a capitalist solution? Why can't we just figure out a way to make the markets work? We can figure out a way to mar make the markets work. The problem is we don't actually push on it. So for instance, in Europe, electric vehicles, right? We've been at $6.50, $7 a gallon for gasoline. Why are they not driving electric vehicles? Because there needs to be charging infrastructure. There needs to be changes to our electricity grid to handle it. These are not things that the, the general public can pay for. When you buy your vehicle for $35,000, let's say it's the Nissan Leaf or the GM Volt or whatever it is or the Tesla, you know, do you actually expect to have to upgrade your distribution grid? Do you have to upgrade all of the places where you work in terms of you know, your grocery store where you're gonna recharge? No, someone else has to do that. So the challenge is, is it's rarely the technology. And in cases where it's already cost effective, it's not the policy. So what is it? It's capital, right? I mean, for, for many of you know that I started a company called Sun Edison, which didn't invent a new solar panel and it didn't actually invent a new way of installing solar panels. It invented a new way to finance solar panels. And today, about 75% or so of all the solar that's installed in the US commercially actually uses a form of the contracts that we created around the power purchase agreement. Now, I don't necessarily think I'm smart. I mean, in fact, I think I'm probably you know, average at best, but, but the thing is, is that we actually looked at the problem and said, instead of actually hoping and praying that everything was gonna be free, how do we actually drive capital? How do we drive people who want long-term, stable rates of return, as opposed to, you know, what the stock market's been doing since 99, to actually invest in things that actually will give you a long-term stable rate of return? And, you know, this comes to Moore's Law, right? Many people have looked at Moore's Law and said, Jigger, it's a technology law. It's a law that basically says that we can put more semiconductor chips on a, on, on a unit area. It's not. What it is, is it's, it's a way of actually driving the market so that everyone's working on the same thing. So that we don't have 50 different things going on at the same time. Everything's, everybody's working on the same goal. So what's our goal here? What goal do we, do we have in mind? We want to meet the incremental transportation demand from non-oil resources. Do we want to change all of the oil overnight? No, because we don't have the capital to do so. The oil industry spends between governments and, and the oil industry and, and all of the subsidies that are provided by multilateral development organizations, something on the order of one, one and a half billion, sorry, one and a half trillion dollars a year. One and a half trillion dollars a year, right? So we can't actually replace it all, but we can replace an incremental amount every year, which is about four to five million barrels a day of oil every single year, right? We can shift investment away from new exploration and towards solutions in efficiency in automotive fuels. So what are some of the options? I don't expect you to read all of this, but, to, but we know what the answer is from the Partnership for a New Generation of Vehicles that the Clinton administration invested in to others, we know diesel engines, hybrid cars, plug-in hybrid vehicles, all of these technologies exist. We know how to lightweight cars. Amory Lovins worked on the hypercar and figured out how to use carbon fiber to actually make cars not only lighter, but actually safer, you know, safer in a car crash. Why don't we do it? Because the cars are, are you know, would sell for $3,000 more per car. Well, you know, would, would you guys be willing, if we had 10 million cars, would you be willing to have the US government spend $3,000 extra per car instead of spending it in Iraq? Instead of spending it in <laughs> Afghanistan? Right. Instead of spending it on $36 billion a year on oil subsidies, right? I mean, this is the challenge. We make a decision every single day on infrastructure, and it's a lot easier on electricity. I'm not suggesting electricity is easy, but it's done at the state level, right? Electricity is regulated at the state level, so we can actually, you know, try to find a level playing field there. At the federal level, you know, they don't really have a big role in electricity, but they do have a huge role in transportation. 
Different states don't really have a lot of control over their transportation fields. So it's important for us to look at these things. Trucking efficiencies. We know exactly how to double the efficiencies of trucks. We know how to actually figure out a way to, act to put two 40-foot shipping containers together and actually you know, drive it like you would some of those buses that are split up so that we can save more fuel. These things would actually save about 50% of all the fuel that we use globally for $3,000 extra per car, a little bit more for trucks. So now the question is, is that what other options do we have, right? We've got biofuels. We have electrification, right? This is from the Electrification Coalition. These guys have a bill currently on the Hill which is saying we need to actually start investing in what I was saying before, which is around public infrastructure. So 11 cities or so have, have their ability to do that. So I think it's important for us to know that there are these options. There are these solutions. But how do we put it together to make four to five million barrels a day? So, you know, how do we pay for it, right? The oil industry invests $800 billion a year, half of it's private companies, half of it's the national oil companies, like the Saudi Aramco's and the others, to achieve just a 15% return on equity. All that risk, all of that risk, they only achieve a 15% return on equity. How many people want to buy their stock now? Not that many. Non-OECD governments like India and others invest $310 billion a year on things like, oh, lost my mic here, um, on things on like kerosene subsidies, gasoline subsidies, things like that. And then, you know, the U.S. and other people actually, you know, spend subsidies on production, military, environmental damage, case in point, um, the hydrofracking in, you know, Pennsylvania and places like that, and health subsidies. The National Academy of Sciences just said that, you know, that the, the U.S. government through Medicare, et cetera, spends a lot of money on those things. So what do you do? You know, Reagan said this as well, but in policy as in science, I believe there are clear governing principles. Notably, if you don't want more of something, don't subsidize it. <laughs> right? But what do we do? We subsidize it. Right? So the oil industry gets $2 for every dollar, or the coal industry, et cetera, gets $2 for every dollar they put in the solutions. Is that a good thing? No. But how many of us are angry? How many of us actually are going to stand up and do something about it? We write letters to our congressmen. We figure things out. How many of us are actually willing to get arrested? Very few. Nobody wants a felony on their record. They're worried. They're worried that this is actually going like, to you know, show up next time they try to get a job or whatnot, right? We all need to get, to get paid and we need to eat and whatnot. But do we actually need to live? Do we actually need you know, a place where our kids, et cetera, can, can, can play, can flourish? There is no planet B. So the challenge is, is that here's a curve of all the gasoline prices that are paid in around the world, right? So you see on the right side of the curve that there are some people paying like $10 a gallon for gasoline. Why are we not cost effective there? There are some people paying $7 a gallon for gasoline. Why are biofuels not ubiquitous there? There are some people paying $3 a gallon for gasoline like us. Why are some of the efficiency solutions for automotives not being rolled out? This is our challenge. We know what to do in electricity. We have no clue on what to do on transportation. This is our challenge, and we know what the solutions are. Automotive efficiency, electrification, biofuels. There are lots of solutions, but the challenge is we don't seem to have the guts to do it. So now, the question ultimately is, where, you know, where can we invest? How do we invest that money that was there? Currently, this is how it's being invested. Most of it's in new exploration, some of it's in subsidies, some of it's in consumption subsidies. Where should we go? We should switch it up. Other subsidies are not going to change. Let's be clear. You know, you're not going to get India to stop subsidizing kerosene for poor people who don't have any other, other energy. So that's going to stick around for a little while. But ha only half the capital invested by the oil industry actually goes into new exploration. The rest of it goes into maintenance. So they still have to do the maintenance while we're moving the other way. But how do we get the rest of it? F to get biofuels to get there, biofuels alone, $250 billion, gives you 60 billion gallons of biofuels. 60 billion gallons of biofuels is 4 million barrels a day. So we can do it. We have the money. We have the capital expenses. And it's a lower risk. Right? Electrification. Electrification only needs something on the order of $100 billion a year for the decade to actually get the infrastructure in the ground to actually get us to where we want to go. Can we do it? Of course we can. Things like automotive efficiency, $3,000 subsidies. 
we already are spending $310 billion a year globally to actually subsidize oil today. We could subsidize efficiency instead of subsidizing oil. So the challenge is, natural gas is on here as well, the challenge is that we have to actually narrow this down, figure out the niche, and actually drive a truck through it, literally. Right? We've got to figure this out. All of these general protests around, but I don't want to burn more oil. I don't want to see more drilling in the Gulf, et cetera. Even our president, you know, on June 16th, basically said, well, it's not in our best interest for BP to go out of business. Are you kidding me? The worst safety record in the oil industry forever, from Texas City to this, we desperately want them to go out of business. So we do have solutions, right? Here's a picture of the Nissan Leaf. We've got ships, right? I mean, part of what the Carbon War Room is doing is trying to be clever. One of the things that we did was said, well, we can't get the shipping companies to, to just reduce their fuel consumption because they're the shipping industry, right? They don't pay taxes anywhere. They're flagged in Panama, whatever it is. But right now, most people don't know what the miles per gallon is of a ship. If you're Walmart or you're Rio Tinto or others and you're actually hiring a ship, you pay for the bunker fuel, but you don't know what the miles per gallon is for that. So we've worked on actually putting a miles per gallon rating on 51,000 ships globally. And we're providing that data to the public. What's happening? People are saving millions of dollars in bunker fuel. And finance corporations are saying, if you're going to refinance a ship, I want to know what the miles per gallon rating of that ship is. Because <laughs> you might not actually have any business three years from now. Novel concept. No. It's clever. I think it's important for us as we move into the next generation of, of activism for us not to think that the activist methods that we used 40 years ago will work today. There are lots of things that we can do that are clever. In the natural gas industry, hydrofracking is a big problem. How do you solve it? Give all those people who are leasing their land an addendum to their contract that they force these natural gas people to sign. Sell it on LegalZoom.com, right? Make sure that they have a $2 million penalty in there if they actually mess up your water. You could do that. That's being clever. That's the 21st century. And that's where we need to go. I think that, you know, it's amazing to me how invested we are in solar panels and into shipping and all these other things. But what's, what we're lacking is our ability to actually use 21st century activism tools to actually make this work. We are hugely empowered today. One person, one person in Missouri passed a renewable portfolio standard to get it on the bill. 67% of the voters in 2008 actually voted for it. One person did that. One person put an RPS together in New Hampshire, Laura Richardson, amazing person. Today, one person can make a difference. So are you waiting or are you gonna be that person? Thank you very much.